creature feature. Exploring the realm of the unknown. And now, from deep within the catacombs beneath our studio, here is your master of ceremonies, Sir Cecil Creep. Did someone call? You just heard two of Nashville's legendary horror hosts. For decades, Sir Cecil Creep and Dr. Lucifer guided late-night TV viewers on dark journeys into the macabre and frightful. Fortunately, for some of us, they also brought along a sense of humor. The interesting thing about City Cemetery really today is it is a living outdoor history museum because most of the people buried there have really no place you could visit where they lived, worshipped, worked. Those places have all been taken down. And so the only place to really talk about those people is at the cemetery. Historian Fletch Koch has been researching local cemeteries for many years especially Nashville City Cemetery. Over 20,000 people have been buried there since 1822, including Confederate generals, the man who named Old Glory, and a woman who, for over a century, lay forgotten under a boulder. You'll hear these stories and a lot more on this episode of Nashville Retrospect. Welcome to the Nashville Retrospect Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Forkham. I am also the editor and publisher of the Nashville Retrospect, a monthly newspaper full of old news stories from and new essays about Nashville's past. Because of Halloween, our October 2018 issue has, along with the usual fare, a few stories with a darker bent. Ever hear of the haunted house on 16th Avenue South? An article was written about it in 1974 on the occasion of it being auctioned. The story goes that in the early 1900s, one Jacob Schnell built a magnificent mansion, and when it was finished, he held a coming out party for his daughters. Perhaps because they were German and not from Nashville, very few people attended. Schnell was so angered he ordered his children to let the house slowly rot, and they did just that, the two sisters living there in decrepitude for decades. Halloween used to be a time of vandalism in Nashville. Porch furniture and mailboxes were not safe. A 1926 Nashville Banner editorial urged boys and girls not to destroy other people's property, but also reminded property owners that it was all in the spirit of a good time. In 1976, the Banner wrote a story about Morris Levine and his popular Halloween parties in the Bell Mead area. He gave out paper bags stuffed with goodies like candy, balloons, comic books, and cheap toys. That year, he was expecting 350 kids to show up. But by far, my favorite story in the October 2018 issue is dated 1868. A man wrote a letter to the Daily Press and Times with an extraordinary tale about a young wife and her diamond heirloom ring. One day she took ill. Her husband felt lucky to discover a traveling doctor in town, that is, until the man was later caught trying to remove the ring from the sick woman's finger. The wife soon died, and due to the heat, the husband had her quickly buried, the ring with her. The letter said the family was, quote, sleeping away their tears when just as the moon was sinking behind the hills and everything was still as death, the young lady rapped at the window of her husband's bedroom. When he awoke, he saw her white figure and pale face and she holding up a bloody hand with one of the fingers missing. Was she a ghost? Had she been buried alive? Where was the missing ring finger? Find out by reading the October 2018 issue of the Nashville Retrospect. To see article excerpts and photographs from some of these and other stories, visit our Facebook page. You can pick up the latest issue of The Retrospect for only a dollar at local grocery stores and markets. And at NashvilleRetrospect.com, you can order subscriptions and even back issues. So pick up a copy for a unique way to experience Nashville history. Major Locklear, he earned that title because he fought in three different wars under Andrew Jackson. He fought in the Creek Wars, fought in the Battle of New Orleans, he fought in the first Seminole Wars. And and he was a free person of color, correct? 
yes, he was free of color, and so he could choose to fight in these wars or not, and he chose to fight. Major Jeremy Locklear's story is just one of thousands that can be found at Nashville City Cemetery. When President Jackson came home to visit, he only came home to the Hermitage three times while he was the president. He went to see Major Locklear, he and General John Coffey, and they spent an hour visiting with him. And that was written up in the newspaper. That was considered such an unusual occasion that he'd spent an hour's time visiting with his old soldier in arms. He is well remembered in this town. He's not been forgotten. Fletch Koch is a local historian so well regarded she has a Metro Historical Commission award named after her. She has been researching local cemeteries for many years, an interest that began for her at President Andrew Jackson's home. I was involved with the Hermitage, and so I cared about Andrew Jackson's monument, his family graveyard. And then in November of 1999, many family graveyards were being disturbed and destroyed by developers in Davidson County. And that would be in the newspapers. And they would go in in the night, remove the graves, or simply take away the tombstones and cover up the graves. And I thought that was terribly disrespectful and didn't honor the past and it should be against the law. She decided to do something about this. Working with her local chapter of Colonial Dames of America, they set out to survey every cemetery and record every grave in Davidson County. We were rather naive. We didn't know what we were getting into. And we had 11 volunteers. We thought we'd do that for six months. Well, we're still involved in that. But now we've had 375 volunteers involved. And we have visited and recorded in 505 cemeteries and another hundred have been identified as lost, removed, or destroyed. This work led Fletch to get involved with the Nashville City Cemetery Association, a group dedicated to the preservation and restoration of the city's oldest surviving graveyard. There were others, but because of local geology, it took a few years for the city officials to find a permanent location. There were no graveyards in the downtown area. As we know, we can see rock everywhere being unearthed in development today. They did have a graveyard on the public square. Apparently it was too close to the bluff, and so that was not a suitable place. They then opened another graveyard near Sulphur Springs, but we all know that's a very marshy and flooded area, so that was not suitable. Some were brought from that graveyard to City Cemetery, the early 1920 when it opened. So that is why the city said, we must buy land in the country. And so we look at City Cemetery today, and it's surrounded by buildings and the railroad. But when it opened, it was in the country. And if you think about what a long distance for a procession, for a casket, cortege to go from any of our churches downtown or a residence downtown to City Cemetery in the heat, in the cool, People were much more dedicated to going to the cemetery then than now. By the 1850s, um, cemeteries throughout the nation were becoming landscaped parks, and they were planted, and horticulturalists were involved in the planning and the design of the cemeteries because people did visit the grave sites, and people did go on Sunday afternoon, and people did picnic in graves yards because they were like public parks. The land in the country, which today is at the corner of 4th Avenue South and Oak Street, was purchased in 1820, but it wasn't open for burials until 1822. It just started with four acres and was greatly expanded over the years. There's now about 25 acres. So starting in 1822 through the present time, there are 20,000 people buried in City Cemetery, which is surprising to most people when you go and visit. You wouldn't expect that. And many people were just buried with wooden markers. So over the years, wooden markers, of course, have disappeared. Even stone markers have disappeared. So today, you see 4,000 tombstones with inscriptions. So of 20,000, only 4,000 have markers. 
Uh, but you, um, so the others, it's just a field? It's just, it's just open area? Open area. Mm -hmm. Some lots you can see open spaces. In the back where a majority of the African Americans were buried, it's quite open. But we have put in replacement tombstones for those whose tombstones were lost, but we knew where they were originally. With so many unmarked graves, you might be wondering how one could know who is even buried there. In 1908, the parks were managing the cemetery, as they do today, with the Metro Historical Commission. And they employed a surveyor, and he was an actual engineer. So he went through the cemetery and marked all the sections, and within the sections, all the lots, and within the lots, the names and the inscriptions of those buried in each lot. Without that record, we would not know today as much as we do. We know where people were buried who have no tombstones because of his research, which was printed, and it's all on our website. The National City Cemetery has its own website, and what we have done is place everything we learn, almost, on the website. So it's available to people, free. The website, which is NashvilleCityCemetery.org, allows the genealogically inclined to make discoveries from the convenience of their computers. But the website itself has even provided new leads to some unexpected discoveries. People can send in an email inquiry. So a man wrote from South Carolina, he said, why isn't my forebears grave marked? And he was a little bit abrupt about it. And I said, who was your ancestor? He said, he died in the penitentiary in 1833. So I said, well, there's nothing in the internment books that early. See, the internment books start 1846. So we don't have that recorded. But he gave me the name. And so I, I went to try to find out more about him. And I looked at the cholera epidemic in 1833. And lo and behold, there was an announcement from the sexton at the city cemetery of 19 burials of members, prisoners, inmates who died of cholera. And right below that was the announcement from the penitentiary with the names of those 19 men and the county from which they lived before incarcerated. So then we saw his name, and we could then know the names of the other 18 from the record. And Fred Sahn, who's a wood carver who works for Metro Star Commission, is very talented. He carved the names and the county of, of, reg, of residents onto those 19. And so they now are remembered. The man from South Carolina said everybody deserves to be remembered. And this was a very nice man. He had come, he'd started Baptist churches in South Carolina, then he moved west. He was to issue pensions to Revolutionary War soldiers, and unfortunately, he embezzled, sent five years to the penitentiary, and after a couple of years died. He wasn't a really bad man. And, and are they accurately placed? The, no. Okay, they're just no. there as markers. They're, they're in an area of the cemetery which would have been used for wayfarers and paupers. The, the mayor had the right to bury anyone in the cemetery that died in Nashville who was, you know, stranded here or fell off the steamboat or was a pauper or in the insane asylum. He had the right to bury them there. In stark contrast to these small wooden crosses, you'll also find some large stone monuments and sculptures. One of my favorites is that of Captain William Driver, not only because of his monument, but because of the story of the man himself and his large American flag. William Driver was uh, a member of Christ Church on the vestry, well respected. But when the Civil War came, of course, most of the people in that church were Confederate sympathists. And he was a Union man, as he would have been from Salem, Mass. And so, even though he had been displaying, exhibiting his flag in Nashville on special days, 4th of July, his birthday, across the street on a line, he took it and hid it 
because he didn't want any of his Confederate neighbors stealing his flag. So it's well hidden until the occupation. And he greets the troops and asks permission, could his flag be flown from the state capitol? And that permission was granted. Apparently, he went up and stayed with the flag overnight as it was flying, unfurling in the wind from the state capitol. Driver named his flag Old Glory. And that is where we get the nickname for the American flag. Today, the original driver flag is being restored at the Smithsonian Institution, and his monument still stands at City Cemetery. It's probably been seen more often in films because of his naming the flag Old Glory. He's certainly one of the most famous people in City Cemetery. But he, of course, is not a Nashvilleian. He was a Navy man and had a clip of ship sailed around the world twice, named his flag on his ship, Old Glory, brought it to Nashville. So his tombstone has an anchor and other emblems of, of his history on that monument. Though highly ornate, the Driver Monument is not the largest by far. The grave of a former governor of Tennessee dominates the graveyard. There's a very handsome and extremely large monument to General Governor William Carroll. And Carroll came to Nashville not with the early settlers very soon, opened a nail factory. He was smart. He knew this was a building community and nails were essential. He then joined forces with Andrew Jackson and went off to fight the Creek Wars and was famous at the Battle of New Orleans. Then governor 12 years. So when he died, the state of Tennessee erected his very handsome monument in the entranceway of the cemetery. No one could miss it. And the state paid for that? And the state paid for it. Ironically, the monument not only dominates the cemetery, but also the grave of a former rival. William Carroll had a disagreement with Jesse Benton. Jesse was a brother of Thomas Hart Benton. And the brawl... (laughs) resulted from the fact that Carol and Jesse had had a duel, and that Jackson had been the second for Carol. That made his Thomas Hart Benton angry. So they were very upset about it, and they were angry and they were mad. They saw each other outside the hotel on the public square, and they end up in a brawl with swords and pistols and anything else they could lay their hands on. And the person that came out the worst end of it was Jackson. The doctor said, I'm going to have to amputate your arm. And he said, I will keep my arm. And he did. But Jesse and Thomas Hart Benton then left Nashville soon after. Jesse went to Texas, fought in the Republican War down there to free Texas. Thomas Hart Benton went to Missouri and became a famous senator. But Jesse decided Texas was a mean place, and he wanted back to Nashville. Went to Louisiana, put in a cotton crop to make some money before he came back to Nashville, died of a fever. His wife brought him back from New Orleans, buried him at City Cemetery, 1843. 1844, Carol dies. Carol has an enormous monument placed for him by the state of Tennessee. Jesse had a terribly small tombstone. By 1908, it was misread as Lizzie Benton. But through research, we discovered that that was Jesse Benton. We put in a replacement tombstone for him, but it's very small. Carol's is very large. Even in death. Yes, even. Some win, some lose. The removal of Jesse Benton's body from Louisiana and its reburial in Nashville is not the only one to occur at City Cemetery. In fact, it used to be a common practice, one involving some of Nashville's more prominent citizens. Certain people, when they died out of town, it wasn't easy in the early days to remove and rebury people because there was no embalming. But people did it anyway. They wanted them buried in a particular place. For example, James Robinson, after the Indian Wars were over and after we were a settled city, he then moved to help the Chickasaw Indians in West Tennessee. And he died there and was buried there. But his wife wanted him in City Cemetery. She had him brought back in 1825. So that was a removal and reburial that took place of a, of a famous person. And so now the founder of Nashville is buried in the Nashville City Cemetery. Otherwise, he'd be over on Chickasaw Bluffs, probably in an unknown grave. Yeah, we're fortunate that she did that. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> the other interesting removal 
and reburial, or burial and then removal, is James K. Polk on his return to Nashville. If you look at photographs of him at the end of his presidential years, he's a very old, tired man, not, not well. And so when cholera hit Nashville in 1849, first of all, a slave at Pope Place, Matilda, died, and he died a few days later. Not expecting to die so soon, they had nowhere for his burial to take place. But Grundy family members offered space in their lot at City Cemetery. So with great ceremony, James K. Polk, 11th President of the United States, buried at Nashville City Cemetery, remained there nine months, then ceremoniously and respectfully removed, reinterred at the monument at Pope Place, where he remained and where his wife was buried until they were moved to the state capitol, where they have been buried and will hopefully continue to be buried in the future. Strickland designed that, correct? Yep, William Strickland, you know, he's Nashville's premier architect for the Presbyterian Church, for the state capitol, for two monuments at City Cemetery, which is interesting. One was the monument for a man who worked as a stone carver, John Kane. That's the one that has the tools on it? The tools on the top, as if he just put them down at the end of the day. Very poignant. Those removals and reburials occurred many decades ago, but another one happened very recently, so recently that you can attend the upcoming reburial ceremony for a famous Nashvilleian, his wife, and his slave. In 1890, the Honorable Felix Grundy had been dead and buried in Sea Cemetery for 50 years. He died in 1840. He was buried in the family lot, which there were many Grundy descendants, his daughters, their husbands, his children, his grandchildren. His wife died in 1847. She's buried there. Very much later, in 1875, Ambrose Grundy, who was the servant to Felix Grundy in his lifetime, so he was a slave. He asked to be buried near his master. That was permitted, and he was buried at City Cemetery. So they're in a very large lot. For reasons unknown, no, no documents, no papers have survived. We just have to know that she did this. His granddaughter, who was named Anne Steger, she decided to rebury Felix Grundy and Anne and other members of the family and Ambrose in her lot purchased by her husband at Mount Olivet. So this remarkable removal took place. The descendants of Felix Grundy felt that He'd been buried at City Cemetery for 50 years. He was a Nashvilleian of prominence, and they want him brought back to his original burial site, and that has now taken place. The removal of the remains and the monuments are back at City Cemetery. And this fall, there will be a rededication and a ceremony to honor his removal back to his family lot. The public is invited to attend the ceremony, which will take place at City Cemetery on October 20th, 2018. If you visit the cemetery, which I highly recommend that you do at some point, you'll notice how beautiful it is, with paved walkways weaving through tombstones and mausoleums shaded by huge trees and surrounded by manicured lawns. It hasn't always been that way. It is today beautiful, but it, it truly was not beautiful. It was well cared for up to Civil War. Then after Civil War, the funds in Nashville are limited and care is difficult. But it sort of had a resurgence. They put in a new gate. People were still being buried there. There were groups interested. In 1927, we have talked about James Robertson, but his lot was restored by the DAR and it was in disrepair in the 1920s. Then things went along fairly well, but by 1959, it was in terrible condition. And at that point, Mayor Ben West determined to restore the cemetery. And it was done at that time. But it is a cemetery. It is an active cemetery. There are still a few burials every year. But there wasn't any enthusiasm for it as a historic place at that time. It took a Girl Scout troop there, and it was just sort of a dark and forbidding place. It wasn't beautiful. Tombstones were broken. Box tombs were cracked open. You could look in. 
they, it was not well cared for, it was, it was unpleasant. So fortunately, Mayor Purcell came out at the time of a James Robertson reunion at the cemetery to lay a wreath. And he said, this is an extraordinary place. It needs to be restored. So Mayor Purcell, working with Metro Council, allocated from capital $3 million to restore the cemetery, which took place 2009 to 2011. And so that's why it's beautiful today. Of course, like any historic house, you just don't restore one time. It's an ongoing process. Every year we take Metro Historical Commission receives allocation and a new section is cleaned, tombstones restored again. Anything broken is restored. As noted, much of the early damage done to the cemetery occurred during the Civil War, including all the burial records up to 1846 being eaten by rats. But the grounds suffered too, as thousands of soldiers were buried there, both Union and Confederate. The war itself was very difficult on the cemetery. One, it's right there in close to downtown, in the military area, Fort Negley on the other side, much fortification, army maneuvers. And so it became um, not well cared for. The city had no money for that. Furthermore, it became the burial ground for Confederates before the occupation in February 1862. Then it became the federal soldiers' burial ground, and 3,000 were buried there in the city cemetery. And that became completely filled. So they had to buy additional acres adjoining where another 8,000 were buried. So we're talking about 11,000 federal soldiers in the immediate area of City Cemetery. Are they there today? No, because after the war, the federal government determined that everyone should have a good burial. And it wasn't good to be buried beside a road or in a trench or in a churchyard. So they removed them from original burial sites to national cemeteries and to national national cemeteries, all those soldiers were removed and it ended up being over 16,000 that were removed to national cemetery. But the Confederates were still there and the Federal Army, of course, was not, or well, the government was not interested in removing them, but the women of the community rallied that we must take care of them and they purchased a lot at Mount Olivet, and they then removed probably, oh, they were talking about at one point when they had finished their removals and reburials, at about 1,600 soldiers were reburied at Mount Olivet. Of course, it's now called the Confederate Circle. Not all Confederates were removed from City Cemetery. A general there is known for being one of the first killed in the war. The treatment of the general's body while the Confederates controlled the city provides contrast to how things changed under Union occupation. There are other generals and Confederate soldiers. Uh, I think there are 15 Confederate soldiers there. There are a few Federal Navy men there. Captain Paul Shirley was from Nashville and he was in the U.S. Navy before the war, and he would continue in the war years in the federal service. But the Confederates, of course, dominate City Cemetery, with the first one being buried, having been killed early in the war, January 1862, in Kentucky, the Battle of Mill Springs. And that was General Zollicoffer, Felix K. Zollicoffer, a newspaper man, a politician, a man who was briefly in the Seminole War, was not a regularly trained soldier, but signed up. So he's a general in this early battle when people really didn't understand how smoke filled the alleys and the byways would be, and he, and he rode his horse right into federal soldiers and was killed, as was the Fogg son, Henry Fogg. He was his aide. It was still really a civil war at that time in the sense that his body and the Fogg son's body were allowed to be brought back to Nashville on the train, go through Bowling Green, embalmed in Bowling Green, brought back to Nashville. His General Zalikoffer land stayed at the Capitol. His horse was also brought back 
on the train. The horse had been shot in the ear during the encounter with the federal troops. So the procession from the Capitol to City Cemetery, a long procession with the horse leading the way. You know, here we were fighting a vicious war, but they allowed the return of, of people to their hometowns for burial. Right. That would stop, of course. Yeah. There was General Raines, James Raines. He was a very young general. He was killed in Murfreesboro, and his body was brought to Nashville. They did not want him buried in the city cemetery. They didn't want any ceremony. The Federal Army refused to have any funeral oblations for him. So he was buried quietly in a vault, and then later was removed to, to Mount Olivet. Coincidentally, like William Carroll, Felix Solikoffer also has a rival buried there. A political argument with competing newspaper editor John Marling led to a duel between them in the streets of downtown Nashville. Both men survived their wounds from that encounter, only to end up together for eternity in City Cemetery. But it is not just soldiers and generals residing there. Not surprisingly for Nashville, there are citizens who were Confederate sympathizers too. Reverend Elliott was head of the Nashville Female Academy. He believed in education for women. When the Civil War came, he had to send home about 400 boarding students. It was a very large school, very prominent school. But the Civil War came and he refused to take the oath of allegiance to the U.S. government. And so he was imprisoned and his daughters became spies. And they were finally told to leave Nashville or be in prison, so they did manage to get away. But he was released from prison and became a chaplain in the Confederate Army. So he's there. And after the war, he tried to reinstate his school, but it, it was not possible. So that faded into memory, this wonderful Nashville Female Academy. Nashville City Cemetery is also the final resting place for many African Americans, both free and enslaved. Of the 20,000 buried at City Cemetery, 6,000 were African Americans. And so people say, how could that be? Well, it was always an integrated cemetery from the beginning. So if you were a slave in downtown Nashville in a household or in a business, then your master was required to buy you a lot, pay for your casket, pay for your burial. And so all of their names but for the slaves, it gives the master's name. So that's very helpful in genealogical search for, for those people that happen to be living in downtown Nashville. And then they're free of color. And then, of course, after the Civil War, they were free. But their records have been extracted from these internment records. So you can go in and look at those who were called slaves, enslaved people, or free of color and you can find their, their burial history, which leads to their life history. One was named Frank Parrish, and he was born a slave, allowed to open a barbershop, became free. He not only ran a barbershop, he ran a bathing house. Well, why was that important? Well, there's no running water in Nashville in the mid-19th century, so you could have hot bath, tempered bath, or cool bath, and there were an upstairs salon available for ladies. So he did extremely well. Of the 6,000 blacks buried at City Cemetery, 2,000 of them are children, indicating the high infant mortality rate of the times. Also connected to the African-American history at the cemetery is a white man named William Bedford. He's an interesting man. He has on his tombstone that when he died, he owed not one cent. He was a merchant. He was in War of 1812. And his common law wife was African American. And they had a son, one son. And I think in that time before Civil War, that was very difficult for him in Nashville. He moved to Philadelphia, which was a Quaker city and more accepting of African Americans. And he lived a happy life there. She stayed in Nashville. She had apparently a very fine house on 7th Vine Street South. After her husband died, she inherited his wealth, and she became an extraordinary philanthropic person, giving to charity, owning large tracts of property, and at her death gave $1,000 to Fisk. 
Being our October podcast, I couldn't resist asking Fletch if there are any good ghost stories associated with the cemetery. I, we're always asked that in October, but, you know, we, we don't know any of those kind of tales to tell. There are interesting stories of misidentification, which is not ghostly, but it's curious. When you in a city cemetery and you go straight down that city avenue, you see a big rock on the right. Very peculiar in a cemetery to see a large boulder. So the stories of the boulder, the stories of the rock, the Victorians apparently liked sad tales. And so associated with the rock was that the girl buried under the rock that she was distressed when her fiance broke the engagement. She jumped off the cliff, drowned in the Cumberland River. Or if you didn't like that tale, she and her husband-to-be were going to the wedding and the carriage turned over, she was killed. Or another story, the fiance came down from New England and broke it off with her. So these were all peculiar stories. And they didn't make sense. In 1959, they put a name with the rock. Well, that didn't make sense either, because she was a nice girl who died of consumption, and she was a member of the Presbyterian Church. So we kept, you know, searching for who was really under the rock, or was it just a rock? Well, when we re we had redone the 1908 plat maps that show the sections. In that section on that lot, it showed a box tomb with the name of this sister on the box tomb. That was her grave, and it just had rock. So eventually, because of newspapers, like you, studying newspapers, a sexton reported that Mr. Steele was distressed when his wife died and he went to the quarry. He was in charge of the quarry for the stone cutting for the state capitol. That, he was the superintendent. He had a very large rock put upon a wagon and with many mules dragged to city cemetery. But he did not put a name on it because everyone would remember her name, Anne Rawlings Steele. Well, of course, Time went on, the, the capital was finished. He moved to New Orleans to sell insurance. He never came back to Nashville. There was never a name on the rock and nobody knew who it was. Until you found it through research. Yeah, the research proved who she was under the rock. And it's in the same location today? Oh yeah, and now we have a small plaque on the ground that gives her a name. It's very near the parking area, isn't it? Very right, near? there by the yeah. parking area. And it's, I have seen large boulders in other cemeteries in, in the East Coast. So apparently that was something he was familiar with, but that he thought everyone would always remember her name. And much as I'm sure people wanted to, she too died of lung disease, which many people had consumption. She did not die in strange way off the cliff. Still, and it's still a sad story, though, that uh, she would be forgotten. It was, but now she's remembered. And we put her story on the website for all to read from the newspaper. You may be one of the thousands of people who have sped down Fourth Avenue South and never given the land beyond the stone wall a second thought, have never seen the woman's boulder or the monument to Old Glory's owner. Well, in addition to the Grundy reburial ceremony, the City Cemetery also hosts living history tours every October. This year it will be held on October 27th, but you can visit any day. There are stations on the pathways with historical information and plans are in the works for a guided tour app for your phone. The Nashville City Cemetery Association website also has maps, newsletters, brochures, and even a downloadable book. However you get to the City Cemetery, Fletch thinks it is worth your time. It is a living outdoor history museum because most of the people buried there have really no place you could visit where they lived, worshiped, worked. Those places have all been taken down. And so the only place to really talk about those people is at the cemetery. Our thanks to Fletch Coke for the interview. Learn more at NashvilleCityCemetery.org.
Good evening, my dear friend. It is nice to see you. I am not a loser. Your host for the journeys into the world of mystery. A strange phenomenon occurred in the late 1950s. Ghoulish characters began appearing on black and white television screens across the country, offering up late night showings of scary movies. Nashville's first TV horror host was Dr. Lucifer, a character played by a man named Ken Bramming. Ken said that he created Dr. Lucifer from a, a combination of characters that he'd seen Bela Lugosi, John Carradine, and Vincent Price play. And um, Ken used a, a, a sort of a Lugosi-type accent when he spoke as Dr. Lucifer. So he just sort of synthesized a lot of things he had seen in horror films and dressed in the tuxedo and the, the eye patch. I don't know how he got the idea for the eye patch, but it made him look exotic and unusual and um, carried the long cigarette holder. Sadly, he was a lifelong smoker and died of lung cancer, but at the time, that looked elegant and cool, you know, to hold the cigarette holder. Jeff Thompson is an associate professor of English at Tennessee State University. He is also an expert on television horror, having written books about the show Dark Shadows and its creator, Dan Curtis. He got to know Ken Bramming personally in the late 1970s when they both worked at radio station WZEZ and later WAMB. In 1990, Jeff wrote an article for Film Facts magazine about Bramming's time as Dr. Lucifer and his TV show, Shock Theater. When, it, when the show began, Ken was only the announcer. You know, you heard his voice at the beginning, Welcome to Shock Theater, and the theme song was Modest Mussorgsky's Night on Bald Mountain. But then, uh, in the summer of 1959, the show had been on about six or seven months, Ken got the idea, well, why don't I present the, the movies? So that's how Dr. Lucifer was born, and he spelled it L-U-C-I-F-U-R. He didn't want it to be spelled like Satan, Lucifer. In the late 1950s, such a character was not unique to Nashville. They were popping up in living rooms from New York to L.A. because the fledgling media of television suddenly got access to new content, monster movies. The Universal Monster Movies were released to television in 1957, and the local stations, which needed programming when the networks were not on, bought the movies to show at different times, usually late at night. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! When this dead hand moves, the monster created by a man they called Mad is turned loose to strike terror into the hearts of men. And that's how the idea of TV horror hosts sprang up. You know, the, the movies were scary and sometimes maybe a little too scary for viewers, so the horror hosts were there to sort of lighten the, uh, the mood. Uh, many of the horror hosts did not try to be scary themselves. They were more lighthearted and almost were like spoofs of the monsters whom you would see in the movies. Uh, one of the most famous, of course, is Zachary, and Ken Bramming noticed him. Like a lot of the TV horror host personalities of the time, Bramming was not hired specifically to play the role. He was already working at the station in other capacities. Ken Bramming was the weatherman at WSIX TV Channel 8, which was the ABC affiliate. Years later, in 1973, channels 2 and 8 switched. You remember that. And, but uh, the ABC station at that time and the time when Dark Shadows was on the air was Channel 8. And Ken Bramming was the weatherman, and he did live commercials for banks, cigarettes, record stores, department stores. He also co-hosted the Mickey Mouse Club on Channel 8. Uh, in the control room, Channel 8 would get the, the New York feed of the uh, ABC station in New York. Ken noticed Zachary and saw what Zachary was doing, dressing kind of like a Bela Lugosi Dracula. And so he got the idea a few months into the run of Shock Theater to uh, become the horror host. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> Good evening, my dear friends. This is Dr. Lucifer. And this, All Hallows Eve, is my night, you might say. My night to howl a little bit, hmm? <laughs> Well, I take great pleasure. One way in which horror hosts lightened the mood was to include comedy skits throughout the showing of the movies. Other station employees played a rogues gallery of characters on simple studio sets. They, they didn't have very many sets. Um, they just stood in front of the, uh, a plain background or some, some set that the st- uh, station used for the news or something. But they did have one set that was called the Purple Grotto. It was it looked kind of like you know the entrance to some clubhouse or something, like some shack uh, with some boards across windows and things, but with uh, uh, bloody handprints on the doors. And uh, then one night uh, they went into the other studio where the wrestling ring was set up and shot just the corner of the wrestling ring. They were doing a spoof of the song Tom Dooley, and they used that little bit of the wrestling ring to look like the gallows. In the fall of 1960, uh, when uh, Zach Early, the New York horror host, was famously running for president, uh, Dr. Lucifer ran for re-election to the presidency of Transylvania. Dr. Lucifer said that he had been the president of Transylvania for 200 years and uh, was rather full of himself and thought surely that he would be re-elected very easily, but the twist of the skit was that his nemesis, Granny Gruesome, um, managed to uh, be elected in, instead of Dr. Lucifer. They they did, as I said, they spoofed Batman, they spoofed the... Uh, Loretta Young show, you remember how she uh, opened the doors and came out in a beautiful dress? Well, they they did a spoof called the Forever Young show, but the actress playing uh, uh, the hostess couldn't get the doors open. They were jammed, and so she couldn't come out. So, uh, and and then whenever uh, Shock Theater showed one of the Universal Mummy movies with Lon Chaney Jr. or Tom Tyler, Corky Savely, Ken's assistant, would dress as the mummy. Bramming had a specific target audience in mind for Shock Theater, but the popularity of the show grew beyond his expectations. He said that he was planning uh, to attract, he said we were aiming for the 10 to 14 year olds, but their parents ended up watching the show with them and liking it as much as the kids. For a, a few years, in the late 50s, early 60s, it it beat The Tonight Show in the ratings here in Nashville because not only uh, baby boomers um, were watching, but their parents, you know, who remembered going to see the Universal Monster movies from the 30s and 40s. So it was a, a big hit. And Ken said that he never got any any bad mail from parents complaining about, oh, it's bad, it's scary, it's no, not good. The parents would write and say, we love the show. It, it, we watch it with our kids. The, the movies are, are good fun, and we like the jazz music that you play in the background. Ken made three uh, appearances at Harvey's and other department stores, but he said he didn't want to do any more because it was just too wild. He said the kids climbed all over me, and, and it was just uh, too, too rowdy. Shock Theater on Channel 8 lasted from November 1958 to April 1967. But that wasn't the death of Dr. Lucifer. About a year and a half later, in late 68, early 69, uh, Ken took the Dr. Lucifer character to Channel 17. Not the Channel 17 that we have now, but, uh, but an earlier incarnation of Channel 17. And uh, I think he renamed the, uh, the show The Mystic Circle because Channel 8, I guess, still owned uh, the rights to the name Shock Theater. But the Mystic Circle was a big part of his show on Channel 8. It, they used some sort of camera effect that made a, a, a wavy, uh, shaky circle that surrounded him for some of the time. So Dr. Lucifer did have a short afterlife on that Channel 17 in the late 60s. Um, and then every once in a while would would still pop up in the, the 70s 
he uh, he did a, a PSA for the Department of Transportation, Tennessee Department of Transportation, as Dr. Lucifer. In the 1980s, Dr. Lucifer also made appearances on WAMB on Halloween night, introducing suspenseful old radio programs such as Orson Welles' War of the Worlds, which you heard a bit of earlier. If you'd like to hear more, stay tuned after the show for a bonus clip. But in the early 1970s, Dr. Lucifer passed the horror-hosting torch to another character. Sir Cecil Creep, the, the next great horror host played by Russ McCown at Channel 4. Ken Bramming was the announcer for Creature Feature. He and Russ McCown were friends, and so the voice, the booming voice you hear at the beginning is Ken Bramming. And what was so exciting to me is that Sir Cecil Creep knew Dr. Lucifer. Um, several in several of Sir Cecil Creep's skits, many of most of which are lost now, uh, there are a few that exist. Sir Cecil Creep would mention Doctor Lucifer, or he got a package in the mail from Doctor Lucifer, and and then Ken made one last on camera appearance as Doctor Lucifer in one of Sir Cecil Creep's skits. He was, you know, in in a in a little corner of the screen, kind of like a FaceTime call would look now. Uh, heckling Sir Cecil Creep or bantering with him. So I, as a fanboy, of course, was thrilled to know that Dr. Lucifer and Sir Cecil Creep existed in the same universe. ...of the cosmic consciousness. What a delicate instrument, capable of thoughts of inexpressible beauty, but often enslaved in mindless terror by monstrous horrors that cannot fathom and indeed, horrors that may not exist except within the bony confines of the human brain box. This is Creature Feature, exploring the realm of the unknown. And now, from deep within the catacombs beneath our studio, here is your master of ceremonies, Sir Cecil Creep. Did someone call? Oh, there you are. You're just in time. Tonight, I begin to construct my monster. The first parts arrived only today from Dr. Lucifer. Come with me. He would do this, this whole, this is creature feature, and then it would, uh, the words would waver, and then they, they would go off, and Sir Cecil would come down the stairs, and he would come in and give his signature line, did someone call? Oh, there you are. He would be carrying a lantern, and he would come in and start his spiel. Larry Underwood is a longtime fan of Sir Cecil Creep, having written an article about him for Film Facts' Outre magazine in 2000. He also writes regularly for Scary Monsters magazine. He did, was not a fact-based host like all the horror hosts nowadays. He didn't give facts about the movie. Could care less. I mean, you could take his, his bits and use them for any, any of the show. He would mention the name of the movie, but it was all skit-based. A uh, little short, like on one of them, Dr. Lucifer sent him a pair of legs because he was building a monster. They were used by a little old lady who used them once a week to walk to the mailbox. While you have been enjoying our feature, I have encountered a bit of difficulty in constructing our monster. That scoundrel Dr. Lucifer has sent me an unmatched pair of legs. The left leg is fully one inch shorter than the right. And I refuse to construct the monster on the bias. But they were too long, so he had a saw. He had to make them shorter, and he would saw one of them off, and then they, one was longer than the other. Then by the end of it, you come back, and all he has is two feet. 
Seriously, I've overshot the mark a bit. There is no way the ankle bone can connect with the hip bone. Perhaps I could make a pair of bookends out of them. Then my six-foot shelf of classics would become an eight-foot shelf. Uh, uh, uh. No, I did not get to watch his show. My parents were really strict, so they didn't let me see his show necessarily, which I guess sort of added to that forbidden fruit kind of thing, you know, because I, I would see the ads on TV. I remember real uh, distinctly seeing ads of him coming down tonight on um, you know, Creature Future. You know, he would talk about what's coming up this week. But I did get to meet him at a Boy Scout event, and I got a patch that says Sir Cecil's Ghoul Patrol. Let me admit something right here. I'm a little envious of Larry's patch. I also grew up with Sir Cecil Creep. I can remember as a kid peering through the banisters of my grandparents' staircase just to sneak a peek of Creature Feature when I was supposed to be in bed. Sir Cecil had a look I will never forget. His uh, look was more ghoulish. It, w- it was a, a scary, more monstrous look with the with jagged teeth and uh, his hunched posture. So, yeah, he, he, was, uh, he was an original just like Ken Bramming was. And um, you know that m- many of his skit scripts were written by Pat Sajak. Uh, at that time, Pat Sajak was the weatherman at Channel 4, long before he became the Wheel of Fortune host or had his own talk show. Sir Cecil's alter ego, Russ McGowan, also worked at Channel 4. He was a film editor at WSM. It was WSM-TV at the time. I met Russ the one time. I never met him as an adult, so I never got to have sit down and have a conversation with him, which I really regret because I would like to have met him, you know, when I could sit down and uh, talk business, talk shop a little bit with him, you know, pick his brain a little bit. From what I know about him, he was a really good-natured guy, great sense of humor, could be a little ornery at times, but uh, that was part of his charm. He was a nice guy and um, did a great job with the show. It was funny and quirky, and uh, he called the character a cross between Laurel Hardy and the Hunchback of Notre Dame, or Notre Dame, as he would say. (laughs) He had the Southern draw. He was Sir Cecil Creep, so I guess he was royalty, but redneck royalty, which you gotta love. He had a picture of Floyd Kephart, who was a local news commentator, political guy, on his mantle. And I've asked around about why he kept a picture of Floyd Kephart on the, the mantle and made Floyd Kephart jokes. And they said he just thought that was funny. He <laughs> thought that was hilarious. That's more frightening than Floyd Kephart. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that was his thing. I talked to the director of his show, and he told me that um, he had actually created the drip sound that was in the background of uh, of the show. He said, I did it right there in my sink. I turned my, my I mic'd it and, and just had a drip going, and that's the drip you hear in the background of his show, you know. Um, it was funny how, you know, everybody remembers certain things about it, um, I met a lady at Channel 4 who said she was sort of the unofficial secretary. She said, I would answer his mail for him. And he used to get a lot of mail from kids. Creature Feature ran from September 1971 to December 1973. And like Dr. Lucifer, or maybe like a zombie, Sir Cecil Creep went on to live again. It was super popular. Everybody still remembered it. He came back in the mid-80s at TNN, the Nashville Network. And that's when he became, his show was called The Phantom of the Opry at that time. He was still Sir Cecil Creed, but it was The Phantom of the Opry. The movies were public domain stuff like um, White Zombie, that kind of thing, uh, on that run. But that was nationally broadcast. And so people all across the country, that's where they pretty much got to see Sir Cecil. Uh, They wouldn't have seen the earlier 70s stuff because that was just, you know, regional. So that took him beyond Nashville. Then. Yeah, yeah. Jeff Thompson also has early memories of Sir Cecil, which eventually led him to a very special opportunity. I watched Creature Feature in the early 70s and uh, uh, later met Russ McCown. And in 1991, the first annual World Horror Convention was held here in Nashville. And so I moderated a panel that, that brought... Uh, Dr. Lucifer and Sir Cecil Creep together. 
I had Ken Branning and Russ McCown on the panel. They, of course, knew each other already, and so they talked about their shows, and um, it, it was one of the most popular panels that year at the World Horror Convention. And I'm glad we did it because uh, Russ McCown died a few months, a year or so after that, so I'm glad we were able to give him a little bit of recognition one last time along with Dr. Lucifer. And I'm so pleased that Dr. Gangreen, played by Larry Underwood, keeps Dr. Lucifer and Sir Cecil Creep alive on his shows. That's right. Larry Underwood, who has been telling us about Sir Cecil, is himself an award-winning TV horror host, Dr. Gangreen. When I, when I was a senior in high school, they asked all of us what we wanted to do in 10 years, where we, what, you know, where we, what, what was our ambition? What, what did we want to do? And I started to write host movies like Sir Cecil Creep, but my buddy James Slagle, who was sitting next to me, said, you can't answer that, man. That's too nerdy. You'll never get girls with that answer. So I wrote something completely stupid, like, I don't even know what I'm doing tonight, so the heck if I know. Uh, but I, I was going to write down, I want to be Sir Cecil Creep, or, or something along those lines. I didn't know the term horror host at that time, but that's what I started to write. What got me started was I moved to Hendersonville when my kids were little and they were about to start school. We moved up here and I met a guy who had a cable access show and I was asking him a lot of questions about it. And he just sort of looked at me and said, you're thinking about doing this, aren't you? And I said, no, not really. He said, well, you should. I think you'd be good at it. And so I thought about it. And, uh, you know, the more I thought, the more... I just zoomed right in on the idea of doing a horror host show because nothing else interested me. But there was nothing like this on TV. And I thought, if no one else is going to do this, I'm going to do it. You know, I'm going to do the kind of show that I, want, I would like to see on the air. And now here I'm about to celebrate the 20th anniversary. So I've been, been going strong with it ever since. Chill. Chiller Cinemaniacs, Dr. Gang Green here. Welcome into the lab here on Chiller Cinema. <laughs> hey, we have a great show lined up for you. Glad you decided to join us tonight. Is our all special Ed Wood night. That's right, the master of bad movies himself, Ed Wood. We're going to have a fun show. We've got a. Dr. Gang Green wears a lab coat, and if you look closely, you'll see Larry's Sir Cecil's Ghoul Patrol patch sewn on the front. At drganggreen.blogspot.com, you can see episodes of his TV shows, Chiller Cinema and Creature Feature, and also learn about his upcoming October appearances, such as the Horror Hootenanny Costume Bash and, one of my personal favorites, The Twelve Hours of Terror, an annual horror movie marathon at Belcourt Theater. I asked Larry if he had any other influences besides Dr. Lucifer and Sir Cecil, and it turns out we share a common TV experience, one a lot of you Nashville kids of the 70s may remember. TV show called The Big Show that was on in the afternoons in the 70s, and it was a unhosted movie show, and every afternoon they would show different things, and they showed, I remember at times, they would show the Universal Monster movies, and that's where I first saw those. I remember marathons of all the Frankenstein movies playing every day, one a day for the whole week, Frankenstein, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, Bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> I remember the Creature from the Black Lagoon movies being on there. Creature Walks Among Us, you know. Revenge of the Creature. Revenge of the Creature, exactly. Science couldn't explain it, but there it was, alive, in the deep, deep waters of the Amazon. A throwback to a creature that had existed a hundred million years ago, immensely strong and destructive. So that was fun. And, I, and those seeing those on TV probably did influence me. Yeah, I remember those. I remember coming mm -hmm. home and watching those. They, they, were, they were fantastic. In case it's not obvious by now, like Jeff and Larry, I love scary movies and Halloween. I talked with Larry a little bit about Halloween in the 1970s. I grew up in a uh, subdivision in East Nashville, uh, houses everywhere. Trick-or-treating was big. You know, I loved uh, dressing up in a costume. Been a Halloween fanatic my whole life. Just something about the holiday, you know, just 
just clicked with me. And it's, it's, uh, I remember finding one time at my grandmother's house, I was upstairs snooping around, meddling and stuff I probably shouldn't have been in, and was going through a trunk, and I found an old Ben Cooper costume, and it was a skeleton. Uh, and I have a picture of myself in that costume because it just so happened that it fit me. So, so yeah. But I remember wearing that costume for Halloween and I remember going to Woolco's and picking out the, the costumes, you know, the, the aisle of the vinyl suited plastic face costumes. Those are great. Yeah, those were fantastic. I can uh, remember having those masks on, which you could barely see out of, and walking into a guy wire on a on a telephone pole or something. I just walked right in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't right. see through that mask at all. <laughs> yeah, no, you couldn't see anything. And I, and you would sweat. Your upper upper lip would get a layer of sweat on it. And, yeah, I remember all these things very real vividly. I was lucky enough to visit the homes of Jeff and Larry, and both of them have marvelous collections of TV and movie memorabilia, from posters to models to masks. I, for one, am glad they are saving these memories. As Jeff said of Larry... He uh, uh, is, is, of course, a worthy successor to the Nashville Horror Host, and now he is the Nashville Horror Host, but I'm glad that he is remembering Dr. Lucifer and Sir Cecil Creed. Make a date to visit us next Saturday night at 10.30. Now, I must shake a leg and toddle up to bed. Good night. Sleep tight. And don't let the Betty Bugs bite. I get a kick out of you. <laughs> Our thanks to Jeff Thompson and Larry Underwood for the interviews and for the audio clips. You'll find links to their books and shows on the podcast webpage, as well as some rare videos of Nashville's horror hosts. Also see a list of back issues of the Nashville Retrospect with related articles, including The Monsters and Dr. Lucifer by Tom Henderson. Thank you for listening to this episode of Nashville Retrospect. For more information about the stories you heard, including photographs, see the show notes on the podcast webpage, which you can find a link to at nashvilleretrospect.com. You can also email your comments and suggestions to nashretroshow at gmail.com. And be sure to tell your friends and family about this podcast. This show was written and produced by me, Alan Forkham. Stay tuned for the next one. And in the meantime, don't forget to pick up your copy of The Nashville Retrospect. celebration as we continue with some delightful charming little stories this one coming up a couple of old friends of mine Bela Lugosi and John Carradine charming fellows absolutely charming the title is The Thirsty Death hmm <laughs> This is Bela Lugosi, welcoming you to Mystery House. Mystery House, starring Bela Lugosi. Mystery House, where live again the stories of the greatest mystery theater the world has ever known, the Grand Guignol of Paris. Mystery House, where tonight the distinguished actor John Carradine joins Bela Lugosi in presenting The Thirsty Death. Uh, good evening, folks. This is Ken Carpenter. If I sound a little nervous, it's not really my fault. I'm usually a pretty steady guy, calm as anyone, but, well, this is asking too much. Bela Lugosi alone is enough to scare you. John Carradine isn't exactly soothing to your nerves, but 
put them together in a story set in darkest Africa with mad dogs howling in the background and, whew, well, find out for yourself. Thirsty Death, starring Bela Lugosi and his guest at Mystery House, John Carradine.